I'm Dave Cates, President and CEO of Denison Mines Corp. Uh, we're a uranium developer and explorer focused in the Athabasca Basin region of northern Saskatchewan, uh, currently advancing the Wheeler River project uh, to become the first in-situ recovery uranium mine in Canada. Uh, we're traded on the TSX under the symbol DML and on the NYSE American under the symbol DNN. David. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good to meet you. Uh, you're a familiar face on Crux, but this is the first interview that you and I have had. Um, forgive me if, out in my curiosity, if I repeat some of the things that uh, you've already covered with Matt, but perhaps it's useful to refresh viewers of uh, the kind of the fundamentals of the company anyway. Your lead project, uh, the, the Phoenix part of the Wheeler uh the, the, the Wheeler project, and you're doing this ISR, the in situ recovery. Um, last year, I mean, I, in, in your presentation, I can see that you've done a feasibility uh, flow test. Is, is, is that right? The FFT. Um, uh, yep. Yeah, we call it the feasibility field test. F feasibility field test. Um, could you just kind of tell me what the results were of that and, and how that worked and where that fits into the development pipeline? Yeah, Merlin, look, it's, uh, it's a critical part of our story. Um, over the last several years, the work that uh, we completed with the with the feasibility field test. But really to talk about it, we have to go back in time uh, because it was the product of, of years, years of, of technical de-risking. Uh, we, we produced the pre-feasibility study for our project in 2018. And that's where we declared that we felt uh, Phoenix, which is the very high grade deposit of Wheeler River, uh, was amenable to ISR mining. And we immediately went into years of technical field work to de-risk the deposit for this mining method. And all systematic, one step at a time, tackling the technical uh, questions, just, uh, you know, in a mechanical, systematic way. And that's why all of our results were so successful over those years, because we were constantly attacking what mattered. And that gave us the foundation to then attack the next thing that mattered. And the feasibility field test was really the culmination of all of that work. I mean, we were doing raw data collection on flow rates, uh, testing that we could move solution through the ground, and that's critical for ISR mining. A mining solution wells, dissolve uranium while it's in the ground, and then recover it up without ever excavating any rock. Um, so we spent a lot of time on permeability and hydrogeological modeling, and in parallel, we were doing all sorts of work in the lab to assess how we might actually um, extract that uranium from intact core samples uh, in a way uh, with the very specialized tests that were focused on metallurgy as if the core sample was in the ground rather than metallurgy that was focused on conventional metallurgy is often like if you have the rock in the mill and you've crushed it and grinded it and all that stuff. We can't do that for ISR. So we have these two streams of uh, test work on uh, permeability and flows, and test work on metallurgy and leaching the rock um, in, in the lab. What the test did is it pulled those things together. So now we had hydrogeologic models for our test area and throughout our deposit of how the fluids would flow. We had lab work showing us how the uranium would leach out in an environment controlled as if it was in the ground. What we wanted to do is put the two things together. So that's what the FFT was all about, is we took a part of a commercial scale test pattern that had been installed to test the hydrogeologic characteristics of the fluid flows, and we operated it essentially as a pilot mine where we injected our leach and, and mine solution like we had engineered from all of our lab tests actually into the deposit in that test pattern so that we could see how the two things would relate together and corroborate all of the work we'd done in the well field with all the work we'd done in the lab. And that's where the test uh, was really was really all about. And you could see just from this introduction that it wasn't a thrown together um, field test. Like it took years and tens of millions of dollars to collect the information necessary to execute on that test. And I would layer in maybe even one uh, other challenge would be getting it permitted. You know, we can't uh, we can't just put an acidic mining solution straight into the ground for the fun of it. Um, you know, we had to have extreme technical rigor and data uh, to back up what we were doing, and then environmental assessments essentially 
to show that our test itself was responsible and could be safely managed in, in the context of the environment. And so we actually were permitted before we even built the facility, before we carried it out, the first hurdle was getting it permitted by the federal regulator uh, and the provincial regulator. Um, David, thank you. That's a, that's a comprehensive answer. Quite a lot to unpack in that. Obviously, when you're, or maybe not obviously, but when you are doing ISR, what you need is you, you, you want the permeability so that the fluid flows through the rock. But um, you can achieve permeability through fracture planes where the fluid flows very well from well to well but it doesn't it just flows down a fracture and you can take out the uranium a lot on a fracture plane but it doesn't take out the uranium that's kind of in a in the the um, the pore spaces of the matrix of a sandstone so you also need the flow through the the mass of the rock rather than just down the kind of the cracks around the edges of the blocks um and so you need that uh, not just the porosity where the uranium mineralization is, but the interconnected porosity, which isn't just dominated by fracture flow. And you can also get these fluids will flow down the kind of the path of least resistance. So you can kind of get preferential flow down a fracture with leaving the, the bulk of the uranium untouched in the mass of the, 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 the core. Um, were you able to investigate those kind of relationships? Oh, look, Marlon, that is a, it's a really uh, astute question, right? Um, there are some real differences between our deposit and conventional low-grade ISR. Um, and no doubt, we have done extensive testing on exactly what you're talking about. In fact, uh, those core leach tests where we've taken intact pieces of core, they, of course, are not exploiting the, mac the, the larger scale permeability that is achieved uh, or, you know, enhanced by the fracture network or the, or the, or the in the broader uh, deposit. So we do have uh, a really high level of confidence around the permeability that we actually can have throughout the environment uh, subsurface there, not just through fracture network. Uh, we have done thousands of permeameter samples of core uh, we've built up a, an enormous database that shows us how fluids will flow in that matrix permeability. And then we have, of course, done larger scale bulk tests in the well field using test wells that also layer on that, that more bulk hydraulic conductivity that we achieve where we are able to also exploit uh, the fracture network. The, the important thing to know for us, and you're absolutely right about one of those challenges, is that if you have preferential pathways, you may not be able to access parts of the ore body. Well, you know where that's a particular issue is where you have a very low-grade ore body spread out over a very wide and vast area because you could see where you're seeking and because really with this ISR, I always say it's like seek and destroy. You're putting a mining solution in and you're trying to uh, get contact with the uranium so you can dissolve it. Well, if your mine is operating at less than half of a percent or some of them are like 600 ppm, well, think about that. That's a very sparse bit of uranium. It's, it's literally like if it's 600 parts per million, that's very sparse. Uh, your well field will have large spacing between two wells. So you end up with a preferential pathway, essentially could be useless uh, in terms of being able to access very sparse uranium. What we've got is ultra high grade. So we have an average grade of 19% in our indicated resource, but most of the um, uranium is contained within a high grade core uh, where we have grades over 40%. And so now start to think about that. If you have a preferential pathway, it's in a, a mass that is 40% or higher uranium. So as you were to travel through that, you would mine a face of the uranium to expose what? More, Another face. More uranium. uranium. Yeah. Um, so our well spacing, because of how dense and how small the footprint is of this high grade, we do not have 100 meter space wells or 50 meter space wells. Our, our test that we ran for the FFT had a 10 meter spaced well, had a five meter spaced well. We can afford that kind of well spacing because every well is essentially into a very rich ore body and certainly pays for itself. So we are acutely aware of those kind of challenges that can happen in ISR, but given the nature of this high-grade ISR, we can be tight, uh, and we have done that matrix permeability testing. Maybe one last part. 
because of how dense our ore body is, we've designed a freeze perimeter. It's a freeze fence that goes around the outside of the ore body. It's not prohibitively expensive because our deposit is not very large from a footprint standpoint. That creates opportunities uh, in the life of mine where effectively you don't have to sweep through the well field the same way. You can achieve over life of mine in areas even a bit of a sit and soak where you can really allow things to move slowly, leach uh, differently than when you have to manage the cost of a very far spaced well field, trying to find that very little bit of uranium that's left over. We have a whole lot of different tools now where we have containment. I mean, you could, uh, notionally, you could flood the entire uh, ore body and you would be leaching uranium through all that matrix permeability because you're you not all about sweeping it through and flushing yeah. it through. Um, D David, thank you. And I feel slightly self-indulgent asking these questions because I, I never hear anybody speaking about them, which is why I want to ask them. Um, the, 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 on that, uh, and on that very topic, the sulfidization of the acid, the, the neutralization of the acid, how did that respond? And presumably having a small volume helps. Um, w was that in line? with with your expectations obviously I, I know the answer already because you've done so much test work but um tell me about the um the cost implications of neutralizing elements of the of the um target area merlin maybe we'll just set set a little more context for everyone to let them know there's sort of three three phases to that field test we completed uh, the first phase was leaching where we acidified the well field uh, and we had some very good results there. We achieved, uh, you know, a level of acidity that would recover uranium uh, within, you know, two to three weeks in our test pattern, which is exceptional. Um, I mean, most well patterns will take months to acidify, but again, we're in a tight space. We then operated uh, for 10 days at that once we had acidified adequately, and we recovered 14,400 pounds U308 in solution through that uh, leaching phase, and that was with one injection well and two recovery wells, which is a partial pattern, but was notable because the pattern itself has six million pounds within it. Uh, it's just in how dense that deposit is that you don't need a lot of wells to test a very uh, meaningful area. So that got us through leaching. We shut off the leaching phase after that because we're managing uh, a fixed amount of uh, uh, storage capacity where we're covering all of the solution uh, for, for, uh, and storing it for further treatment. We went into neutralization and we completed the neutralization phase, the second phase, uh, before the end of last year. It was also highly successful. Uh, through leaching, we hit or exceeded all of our uh, targets. Same in neutralization. Sorry, uh, neutralization takes place at the surface in the pilot plant. No, we, we neutralized the well field. Right. So okay. we had acidified the well field, okay. and then it was a question of, okay, now we need to, we've recovered uranium-bearing solution in our storage tanks. Now we need to test, from an environmental standpoint, our reclamation plans. So we went ahead and we went through a neutralization phase to restore the pH levels in the well field at depth to environmentally acceptable levels. That phase also went uh, exceptionally well. Uh, I think in, in you know we probably beat some of our internal targets on how long it would take uh, to get that pH back. So we were really sat satisfied with our ability to restore the well field to that environmentally acceptable pH uh, as quickly as as we did. The third phase of the test, uh, which is is will resume in the spring uh, when when our solution thaws, is taking all that recovered solution. And um, we'll do basically run a water treatment process to reduce the volume of stored material and return some of the treated water back into the formation. Now, important for everyone, the first two phases uh, were necessary for us to um, complete our feasibility study. The third phase, uh, we, call it, we call it recovered solution management. It's really a compliance phase. There's no new data that's going to come from that phase. That phase is just about meeting our permit conditions and reducing the amount of material we store on surface. Uh, the first two phases were the ones that we 
uh, really needed to get the results for to be able to proceed with the feasibility study. Good. Now I'm going to pull myself out of the rabbit hole of the technical questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's. Th- there are some kind of high level stuff that I'd like to just touch on, please. Um, first of all, the the First Nations uh, situation in Saskatchewan. Um, is this going to change your development timelines? What are you doing about engagement? And is is this a a real worry for you? The the, the change in um, tone of the dialogue. Well, Merlin, it's interesting. I mean, you say the change in tone, um, and we would say there's there's uh, nothing is nothing has happened in Saskatchewan that uh, we weren't already aware of, and that hasn't already informed our business plans. And um, you know, I would say that we're an industry leader in in terms of what we're doing on the Indigenous engagement front. I personally, uh, oversee our activities on that file uh, because I see it as company critical. And our board of directors agrees. Uh, we adopted an indigenous people's policy. Uh, we are the only player in, in Saskatchewan that has that. It's available on our website. It's a public document, board approved, that outlines uh, our role in the reconciliation process that's uh, you know in, in progress in, in Canada and how uh, we respect the rights and the interests of, of, of indigenous groups that have traditional territories where we're operating. And what we've done is um, we've developed a a, a plan that is based on taking action uh, rather than just on uh, saying nice things. Uh, And our basis for that is um, the the foundation to that plan is what we call uh, our exploration agreements. So we have agreements with multiple indigenous groups, and they are generally called exploration agreements. But it's important to understand what they cover. They cover all of our activities Uh, essentially before we have a mine that we're building or producing from on all of our properties. And they set out a basis for a relationship uh, with different Indigenous groups. And it shows that we respect their Indigenous rights, we we respect the um, uh, connection they have to the land that, that we have projects in and that we're working. And we share benefits. And that is something that uh, it was not common. Uh, in Saskatchewan for pre-mining projects, the fact that we would already be sharing benefits uh, with groups before we've even got something that is generating a a positive cash flow for us. Uh, We have set the standard for this. We have seen other companies uh, follow along uh, because these agreements are more than just, um, like they're certainly commercial and in our interest to make these agreements, but they're in our interest because they set a relationship in 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 place where we can respect each other and we have we have a process that we agree on for how to get permits approved for how to consult for how to engage and there's something a, a term that's being used a lot in in our landscape right now is around consent and consent is something that i think a lot of people are terrified of um you know does it create a a veto um you know to to require consent and um you know, I, 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 I spoke to a, a very wise uh, Indigenous advisor several years ago, and he quite simply explained to me that there was a way to have consent as a process rather than consent as a, uh, a binary yes or no. That, that's really what we've worked towards is these agreements creating the arrangement where we can operate in a way where we actually are obtaining consent, but by process rather than consent by um, veto. And uh, and also, uh, that's a good point about it being a non-binary process, because if it's a binary process, everything hinges on that one moment, and then uh, you can feel uh, grieved or something else if, if it doesn't necessarily go exactly your way. Um, hearing you speak, uh, the, the, I, I, it feels a little bit like mutual enlightened self-interest uh you know that th- there is um a, a lot of discussion about enlightened self-interest as being kind of a driver behind some um proactive behavior but w- seeing it from the other side as well it, it um i think that kind of that word mutual um can come into play as well um and just just on that you you you've you mentioned in your text something about the treaty 10 boundary does that um can you put that into context with the treaty 10 and what you've just been describing yeah so there are a number of treaties in in canada 
that are important legal and historical things. Um, I think the easiest way, Merlin, to, to, to sort of talk through the indigenous environment in Saskatchewan is because treaties are not all that matters. Um, and, and that's why I sort of divert from that, is that there are multiple groups. Um, it is not, uh, the Athabasca Basin is not one part of town that uh, there is one primary uh, indigenous group. There are multiple groups that have that require companies to have a deep understanding of the history and the use of the land. And so the indigenous groups that we're working with uh, for Wheeler River, well, they, they would be different than, say, the indigenous groups we're working for, with when it comes to like our Waterbury Lake property. And so that knowledge is, is very important uh, because it is really driven by the uh, concept of indigenous rights, and that is something that's related to the treaties and the different treaty coverage, but it's also about uh, traditional territory and land use and just interests that different groups have in the land. So it is, um, it is complex and it, it does require skill. What I can say is that we have an excellent team that has a great amount of knowledge and history in this region, and that's part of why we've been able to navigate this complex environment to have multiple exploration agreements in place and to have excellent relationships in place. It, it sets us up for what fundamentally will be necessary for these bigger projects or the projects that move forward, which are like impact benefit type agreements. And those are actively under negotiation uh, right now when it comes to the Wheeler River project. Talking about moving things forward, uh, let's move on to environmental impact statements. Um, what's the timeline on that and um, how does that fit in with uh, your approach to feasibility studies? So kind of both of those timelines, please. Yeah, perfect. I mean, the, the ultimate objective is uh, to build the uranium mine, right? So if we work back from that, uh, we have a few uh, parallel streams of activity. Uh, so one is, of course, the technical side. Uh, feasibility study is uh, nearing completion. We've guided that the feasibility study is on track for uh, completion during the first half of 2023. So that remains true. Uh, on that path, after the feasibility study, we would be moving into uh, front-end engineering and detailed design. And so the end of that path is the completion of detailed design. We now have the level of detail necessary to start construction. The, the path that's running next to that is regulatory, uh, and that includes the environmental assessment. So the, the objective at the end of that is an approved uh, EIS, as well as uh, licenses in hand and permits uh, from our federal and provincial regulators. So on that track, um, we submitted the draft environmental impact statement in October of 2022. Uh, we are now actively in the uh, review phase, which involved a public review period, uh, comments, questions that we will then respond to that will no doubt trigger further follow-up questions and further responses. So we're trying not to guide uh, too granularly on that process because it really does depend on the nature of the questions and responses. But broadly, we would say from the October submission and acceptance of our draft EIS uh, from a conformity standpoint, from that date, you're in the two to three year period to be able to be complete that second stream, which is environmental uh, permitting and uh, the associated licensing. And so the idea is that these things come together. The sort of third stream is financing, right? Uh, that those things come together so that we can be in a position to make a development decision and start construction. Uh, thank you. We're looking at your pre-feasibility study and uh, seeing the uranium price used to $44, um, it's really nice because most other players in the uranium sector pick a uranium price, which is... Um, well, Merlin, we, we, used, uh, we used $29 for the first year of production at Phoenix, and it does rise over the 10-year mine life to about $45 for Phoenix but it's pretty straight line using UXC's price strip. So it's even more in the money uh, than you might've been thinking uh, because that NPV in that PFS is, is, is weighed down, if you will, by the fact that our first pounds were sold at between $29 and $30 US per pound. David, when I look at other sectors, many of those sectors trade at a significant discount to their NPVs. And yet um, uh, Denison has 
I mean, if you take off the value of your your cash and tradable securities and the, the uranium stockpile, you're pretty much trading at one times NPV, albeit on an old um, an old data. Does that, uh, in your view, make you feel that you're overvalued? No, I'm really uh, quite quite the opposite. I mean, we 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 share that um, uh, feeling actually uh, that we trade at quite a discount to our NAV or, or our assessments of NPV. Uh, particularly when uh, you take the uh, physical uranium off off the table, I mean that is an asset that has uh, no no business or operational risk, and uh, when you take that off of our market cap and then compare it to our underlying NPVs, particularly for our basket of assets, rather than just our single asset, uh, we're absolutely trading at, at a significant discount and. I think on top of that, um, look, we accept that that is the nature of, of some of the development companies and certainly the nature of the market we're in right now, uh, where, where companies are trading at uh, significant discounts to NAVs. It's obviously a, an investment opportunity across the sector. Um, but um, look, we, we we really do see it as something that uh, we, we've been not penalized for, but um, you know, the timing of some of our key news around the feasibility field test. And that's why I'm so grateful to talk about it at, at length, uh, you know, over and over, um, meant that uh, when the markets, when we came out with a lot of that news, the markets were not in a place to be overly receptive to that. And uh, we do think that that uh, reflects that there's a valuation uh, opportunity on our stock, even relative to our peers, because the, the significant de-risking that we've achieved through that test work uh, has not been reflected in, in, in our stock. And uh, the other area is our portfolio assets. I mean, I have talked about it uh, subtly and, and progressively a little bit more loud that uh, to use the Wheeler River NPV is uh, as, as a standalone for a, like as if we're a single project company. Well, that's, that's, that's totally not appropriate. But I've been progressively talking about the work that we're doing on our other assets because one has to see the success we've had with Phoenix and ISR and realize that we are a clear industry leader. We have a competitive advantage over any of the players, no matter how big or how small. I'm talking Cameco. Uh, I'm talking any of the juniors, because uh, that anyone. I mean, we are the leader in ISR mining in the Athabasca Basin. We have the knowledge. We have the data. We know how to make this work. We've done the test work. And we have other assets with this mining method. Sort of a pipe, is a, a pipeline is of projects, kind of a portfolio of um, in the same area. Um, I, um, I, I also just saw the the, the Moon Lake South uh, news release. Could you? I mean, it, it's hot off the press. So, um, could you just tell me a little bit about it, please? Well, yeah, Merlin, this is a, a very exciting development for us. I mean, so of course we have more advanced projects in that pipeline, like our Waterbury property with the THT deposit. We have a PEA on on the ISR mining of THT. We've recently announced uh, great success with our partners at Arano. On our Midwest project that we're advancing, the, that's the one where you're boring down into high-grade stuff using kind of the saber tooth. Well, yeah, I mean historically we've tested saber, but the news release from earlier this year highlights that we carried out an internal concept study for ISR at at Midwest, and the it was very positive. And now we've got our partners agreeing to continue to invest in ISR at Midwest. Where Moon South fits in is it's now evidence of our exploration teams focus on finding new ISR amenable deposits. That is our priority. And uh, others in the in the industry are, are, are maybe lagging. And that's fine because we have the highest confidence in the industry about ISR mining in the basin. But we are looking for deposits that are hosted in sandstone. And that's where Moon South is just so exciting. Not only is it high grade after very few drill holes, uh, not only is the property close to Wheeler River, where we're, of course, uh, going to be building our Phoenix processing plant uh, for that ISR operation, but we've hit high grade perched in the sandstone. And so perched means that it's not at the contact point between those basement rocks and the sandstone. What's exciting about that is it's, it's not typical to find perched mineralization on its own, especially high grade. What's typical is to find perch mineralization associated with something more substantive that is at that contact between the basement and the unconformity. Those are the geologic settings that we see as optimal for ISR mining. So it's an early result, very good result on its own. But what we're so excited about is the fact that this could uh, turn into 
a satellite operation for a Phoenix plant. Uh, and really the sc scale and size of this discovery, I mean, we've we finished our winter program and we have uh, an enormous amount of follow-up to do. Uh, it's all to be determined, which which for the exploration side of our business is just very, very exciting. Why why hasn't ISR taken off in the Athabasca to date? Is it, I mean, I, I imagine the Athabasca sediments to be compacted and impermeable and compressed and uh, and old. Um has that been a factor, and you're just you're, you've been lucky to find an area which has got the fracture, the 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 the, the poor permeability, or the, the the porosity, and the connectivity? Um, I mean, why why not? Why why has it taken until you guys to to drive this well established technology? Yeah, look, that's an excellent question. Um, look, at the end of the day, you you do have to remember it is different in that we've got these high grades, so. The, the nature of what we're doing is very similar to conventional ISR, but very different because of the nature of the deposits. Um, we have all the ingredients. We absolutely have all the ingredients we need, and we believe that Phoenix is highly amenable to this. We believe other deposits uh, can be as well. It requires an enormous amount of capital, time, and expertise to test those deposits properly because they will not all be applicable. Um, the work we've done... You know, and in our mind, we are suggesting that the THT and Midwest have that have those types of ingredients. We have to do more work. Moon South seems positive as well. But um, the reason why this has not been done before, it's, it's really because it wasn't needed. And you have to look at the other deposits that are mines today in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, some of them, uh, historically, were in, in basement rock, uh, you know, like an Eagle Point. I mean, so that was not going to be applicable to ISR. Uh, some were near surface, like our mined out uh, deposits at McLean Lake, where they could be accessed uh, economically via open pit. And then the producing mines today, MacArthur River and Cigar Lake, while they share many similarities to what we have at Phoenix, they are much larger. And so the com complex underground mining methods that are being deployed there, they work and they're profitable because they have enormous scale. And so there's something that says, like, it's not wrong that Cameco is using underground mining uh, for those deposits. They're, they're very successful using their specialized underground mining approaches. And so they didn't really have to come up with this solution. Uh, for us, this really roots back to 2016, where we assessed Phoenix and, and our Griffin deposit using all the conventional mining methods. And it turned out that our Griffin deposit, which is, you know, 2% grade, compared to Phoenix at 19%, well, using conventional mining methods, Griffin was a uh, higher margin because it was in basement rock and the geology was less complicated and it was a better underground mine. And we decided that, you know, we would invest, despite the markets being challenging, in assessing whether there was a better way to mine Phoenix. And so it was the necessity of it that we have a 19% average grade ore body and somehow it had lower margins than a 2% grade because of the geologic setting. Think of all the issues. The rock is disrupted. It's water permeable. Cigar Lake flooded three times. It was a very difficult thing to mine. Here we are trying to mine a 70 million pound deposit in that situation using conventional methods that were very costly. But as it turns out, all of those challenges are now actually attributes. The fact that the ground is so broken up and permeable means that fluids flow through it. We now have uh, the mining method that exploits the natural characteristics of the deposit instead of trying to compensate for it. But it, it really was driven by our necessity. And with the other deposits, you know, Chemical really didn't have to go and, and try to find a, a different way. Uh, David, thank you so much. This this interview has gone a, quite a different way to what, what I was expecting, but I've really enjoyed learning about uh, ISR in the in the Athabasca and and Denison's role in it. Um, just I think as kind of by to wrap up, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, kind of the the the, the weak market when you were pu publishing news in October um, Q4 last year. It's still a bit soggy in the uranium space. Um, can you? Kind of talk to me about some of the catalysts that you may control um, for the rest of this year, and what you you are looking for, kind of from the macro external uh, side of things as well. Ah, Merlin, it's it's soggy in all the sectors. Um, you know, I actually think uranium has held up pretty well uh, compared to uh, a number of the commodities. The equities 
uh, maybe not as well. Uh, and so we trust me. I mean, I'm a, I'm a s- significant portion of my personal net worth is uh, is is vested in this company, and so I follow that all very closely. Uh, but I'll tell you, I don't lose any sleep because the fundamentals for our uh, uranium sector um, are are excellent, and they are not deteriorating. Uh, what we're seeing is broader market uh, deterioration, and of course, while everyone has to be responsible with their investing. Uh, I, I can say my view is that the fundamentals for uranium are improving day by day. Uh, in terms of our company, uh, again, not losing any sleep because uh, we have some excellent catalysts uh, on the horizon that can drive value on our own. And one doesn't have to look very far beyond the feasibility study to see that that will be a, a material notable update to our project, uh, which will give the market great confidence that not only have we uh, updated our numbers and here are very current uh, numbers in the cost environment and the uranium market that we're in today, uh, so that you don't have to guess what our project uh, might might produce. You you can see it from a third party. Um, that that should add confidence to what we're doing. Also, the level of technical rigor that is in this feasibility study is a significant increase from the pre-feasibility study, and I do think that that will be something we will be emphasizing. It's truly notable to take a project like this to a feasibility study level. Uh, permitting will continue. Um, technical work will advance over the next uh, several months. Um, in, uh, negotiations on impact benefit agreements also continuing. And um, I think also to look for uh, on the horizon for us is obviously now, again, on the exploration drill bit. Uh, we've been a very subtle story on that. While we've been active, we've been subtle in talking about it. But uh, Moon South is, well, of course, we're excited to follow that up. It's just an example of the type of work that we have in the pipeline that can add real value that will be independent of the broader market. The fundamental value story for our company, the fundamental story for our company is around value. Uh, We are a developer with a very high margin project that has now gone through significant technical de-risking. And where we're going to generate value for our shareholders is mostly within our control and it's the developer to producer re-rate. What we'll then do is offer a further leverage to our commodity price, but we do want investors to see that what we offer is is the uh, re-rate from that conversion of developer to producer, and our credibility and the work that we're doing should give everyone confidence that that is something that we're focused on achieving.